at Govan Hill Baths on 99 Calder Street in Govan Hill. Since the bath closed in 2001, there has been a lot going on in this building. And over the next two years, there's going to be a lot more going on. But before we reopen in 2018, we're going to go inside and see what the building looks like just now. So Govan Hill Baths, the first one was laid in 1914 but because of a war getting in the way the building didn't open until 1917 as a public bath and wash house. It was part of a, a massive public health drive across the UK where buildings like this were being built in cities to combat public health issues. People were washing their clothes and washing themselves in rivers, there was no sanitation running water at home. There are an Edwardian baths. Unfortunately, lots of the similar bathhouses around Glasgow at the time that were built by the Glasgow Corporation, the logo of which you can still see in both sides of the pool, have been knocked down. This is one of the few remaining that retain a lot of the original features. So these places were not just about swimming and the health uh, of the, the healthy physical activity. They also had hot baths for people to get clean and laundries, uh, what we call in Glasgow, steamies. I learned to swim here, my brother learned to swim here. Most of my pals learned to swim here. Uh, we had good, good times. A friend of mine lost a pinky in that diving board there, did a handstand, went to jump in, left his pinky. He only knew about it when he landed in the water, and the water turned red, and he got thrown out for making a mess of the pool. He went home with his pinky in his hand. <laughs> We've been a, we're an, a nation, or a district of immigrants, I myself, with, I, of I, second generation Irish, and I think it gives it, it gives it a sense of cohesion. Places need a focal point, and if all it, a focal point is simply kids going to a bath on a Saturday, that's as good as any. Govan Hill is the most diverse community in the whole of Scotland. There are 54 languages spoken within probably two mile radius of this um, community. Most of that is concentrated within one square block of Govan Hill around Westmoreland Street. Enormous amount of immigration over the centuries. It used to be called Little Donegal for a very long time because of the mass migration from Ireland. Then we had um, a large Pakistani community come into the area and a very derogatory name, Little Bengal, was, was um, used to describe this area. Migrations have concertinaed itself into a community here that is just full of some of the most diverse people I've ever uh, encountered. So in 2001, the community in Govan Hill found out that this building was going to be shut by Glasgow City Council. Um, at the time, so many other buildings and so many other facilities in the area were being shut down. And when it came to Govan Hill Baths, the community just said no. Um, and what preceded was the longest occupation of a civic building in British history. A number of the parents from the Kingston Swimming Club that used this facility had got together and had organised a group called Save Our Pool. And one of our tactics was to occupy the building. And we did that two days before the official closure, which we knew the, uh, the bosses at the council had given their um, signal they were going to actually close on that date, not the official date. Uh, to ward off anyone occupying the building, but we got in there first. One of the main reasons is that we believe this building belongs to the community. It's a community asset. It has served countless hundreds of thousands of people locally over a number of generations who have loved using this building. It's not just about health and well-being in terms of the sporting and the physical aspects, but it's also about a social space where communities can get together and socialise. An example of that is on men's nights. We had men's and women's nights to cater for the various populations in the area. And on men's nights, an example of this is uh, the building had gay men, Jewish men and Muslim men all using the building together. And that is a sort of integration we think buildings like this uh, promote. People come to use this building for what it provides. Um, 
and unfortunately without this building so much of those divisions have now resurfaced in the community which we're hoping this building will look to reuniting again. What came with the communities like Govan Hill is a huge sense of struggle, of history, of knowledge about how to run buildings like this. Um, and we deserve these buildings. The idea that beautiful buildings like this belong to the rich. You go to the West End here and, you know, you'd be lucky to find a building that uh, earlier than the 1950s. They have a heritage, apparently they deserve a heritage, but working class communities are denied that history and we didn't think that was right. We deserve beautiful buildings, it's us who build these buildings. We wanted this to remain in Govan Hill and so it is. After three years, in 2004, the trust was set up in order to save this building. And because of the intervention from Historic and Environment Scotland, who said that the Glasgow City Council had to have preference for communities and their bids for the building, the trust got into the building in 2008. The project at the moment, after 15 years, is at the brink of finally coming together. We are hoping for the build to start in September 2017. So by 2018, the winter of 2018, we will be swimming again in this magnificent building. So in the next phase of the redevelopment of Govan Hill Baths, we'll be opening up almost every part of the building newly refurbished except the big pool which I'm standing in just now and the back steamy. What we will have is a newly designed foyer and a welcoming reception with a cafe area with accessible and healthy food for everybody in the community to come and enjoy the space. And what we will be doing is taking a 21st century approach to public health with the same sort of aims as the sort of our forefathers that sort of built this building. We will be looking at community health, mental health and, and social cohesion by providing uh, skills classes, uh, art and culture alongside the physical activity. The politics of neoliberalism is what closed this building down. The ideology that communities didn't matter, quite a Thatcherite ideology, but it was taken up by a number of parties. The idea that communities actually thought getting together in a united fashion to run facilities like this, or deserved in fact facilities like this, became an anathema to a lot of communities. For me, principles like self-determination and empowerment are really, really important. I think the era of politicians and those in power doing things to communities is over and the Baths is a part of that, is a part of that reframing of what community means and what local empowerment means. You can't do things to Govan Hill anymore, you need to do stuff with the people of Govan Hill um, and that needs to be said across Scotland and we need to see that change more acutely in every local community across Scotland. The Bass is just a fantastic example, it's an inspiration for other places that feel powerless, that feel alienated from the powers that be. It really shows that with a ton of determination, a lot of hard work and with the whole community behind you, you can really put yourself back in control, you can take back your community assets.
My name's Billy Kay, I'm a writer and broadcaster and I was brought up in the Irvine Valley in Ayrshire, in the heart of the Burns country. So I was brought up with a leaving Burns tradition. All my family were singers. My father played in the brass bond and played Burns' music in the brass bond. And folk would come along with Burns' sayings literally every day. Burns had a saying for it. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee. Your whole world picture was seen through this language. And I feel to this day, we still need to chave harder and harder to work on the survival of the lead. And it's central to our identity. Can we can read what in history? Can we can read what in poets? Can become foreign to what in culture? Then there's no much left to us as a nation. McDermott said to be yourself and to mark that worth being no harder job to mortals has been gained. Well, for us as a nation to be fully ourselves, Scots is an integral pair to that. Scots and the Germanic languages are sib. They're gay thrang together. Eh, so that when I first studied German, I remember in my German reader, practically the first day I learned German, the phrase was, die Tochter milkte die Kuh. Easy for a Scots speaker for Ayrshire. The doctor milked the Kuh. And like that, eh, loads of examples. Goethe is supposed to have asked for mehr Licht on his deathbed when he was dying. The great German writer Goethe asked for mehr Licht. So mehr Licht, get German, get Scots. The other leads have influenced Scots. For example, eh, Flemish. A lot of trade with the Low Countries, big influence for Flanders, Flemish Wabsters coming here, weavers coming to Scotland. But words that they brought, words like your quits for your ankles, or your hunkers, to get down in your hunkers. Scandinavian words in Scots include definitely your lugs and your loof. Uh, cross my loof in Glasgow, cross my loof, cross my palm with siller. And because of the old alliance with France, we have a lot of French words, especially when the boroughs were being established. We're just across the water for the borough of Dundee. Well, when the boroughs were established, they used Norman French words like La Porte, the gate. So you've got the West Port in Dundee. Or in Irvine, you've got the Venel, the lane. La Venel is Norman French for a lane. You've got the borough itself from Le Bourg, a French word. And you've got words coming into Scots later on because of the old alliance for all the French that stayed here. I mean, there was that many French stayed in Edinburgh, around about Craig Miller Castle. It was cried Little France, still is to this day. Birdie House in Edinburgh is supposed to be a Scots corruption of Bordeaux, where the King's wine was stored Lang Syne. So there's all influences that we go directly for Europe. And, of course, we also went to Europe, and there was a lot of cultural coming and going. They left see muckle, a grand legacy, culturally, intellectually, linguistically, or our Europe. Elephant's been described as one of the most political films ever made. And, as in politics, it's a film full of contradictions. Elephant has no plot or characterisation, yet it's tense and unsettling. Although there's no music score and virtually no dialogue, it has a powerful message. It depicts 18 deaths, but it's not an action nor a horror film. The film is repetitive, yet mesmeric. And, there are no elephants. Elephant was made by British director Alan Clark, scripted by acclaimed Belfast writer Bernard McClafferty and produced by a young upcoming filmmaker then working at BBC Northern Ireland called Danny Boyle. 
The title is taken from the idiom Elephant in the Room, a problem so enormous that no one wants to address it. Elephant was filmed in Belfast at the time of the Troubles, a 30-year sectarian guerrilla war involving Loyalists, Republicans and the British Army. Elephant depicts a series of paramilitary shootings based on actual police reports. The executions are carried out in a disturbingly mechanical and matter-of-fact way. The everyday faces and settings change, the outcome does not. Between 1968 and 1998, over 3,500 people died and many more were injured. The killings became so commonplace that the British media gave up reporting on them. Three killings took place in Belfast while Clark's crew were filming. It's impossible to tell who is who in the film. Are these tit-for-tat revenge killings? Are informants being silenced by their own side? Undercover British operatives? The motivations for the killings are never explained. If there is a star of Elephant, it would be the camera itself. The camera is an omnipresent force that places the viewer as witness and accomplice, and seeming to conduct the action at times. But whose point of view are we sharing? Liverpool-born Alan Clark was one of the great political filmmakers. His films often explored issues of class with a distinctly left-wing view. Clark was therefore seen as controversial by the powers that be who censored his work on several occasions. For instance, Scum, made in 1977, was subject to a BBC broadcast ban for 14 years. Clark's other films include Contact, Christine, Made in Britain and his final film, The Firm. All the great, watch them all. But there's only one elephant. I don't know about you, but I'm awfully worried about identity theft because I don't want somebody nicking my identity and going about pretending that me. What's been happening is every night I've been going to my bed and every morning I've been waking up with my pyjama trousers on. Three times in a row this has happened to me. I thought, I've had enough of this, I'm phoning the police. So I phoned them up and he says, look, I'm going to have to ask you a few questions. And he was awfully glad I still had my top on because apparently if they'd got a hold of that, they'd opened up bank accounts and all sorts. So he said, OK, could you describe your trousers? And I said, well, the first pair were navy. Now, they were actually loungewear, but I never bought them outside. And he said, that was a good decision I made there. And uh, then the second pair that went missing, they were, they were grey. They were loungewear as well. And then the third pair, they were... They were my favourites actually, they were patterned and they had a wee cord. Now the cord went missing years ago, I, I wouldn't expect you to get the cord back. It's just really the trousers I want to see again. And he said, OK, before I start the door-to-door -door inquiry, could you just do me a wee favour and check at the bottom of your bed? And he was good, this guy, I'll give him that. I couldn't believe it. There they all were. I said, what do you think happened? And he says, well, we can never really know for sure, but they've been professionals, so they've returned three nights in a row to try and get their hands in the trousers, because they'd obviously had you mapped, and then they've had to flee the scene each time in a hurry and just drop them at the bottom of your bed. I'm glad I phoned them.
my name is Francesca Teston. I'm the creator of the webcomic The History Twins. I'm 15 years old and currently a sophomore in high school. I live in the United States in the Washington, D.C. area with my parents and my younger sister, Giovanna. I've been creating comics since I was about seven years old. When I started, a lot of my ideas came from things that happened at school, conversations, and just funny random things. And I also incorporate history in a lot of my comics, which I've always been interested in. I think I can safely say that my comics have evolved as I've gotten older. I'm much more interested in history, and I've done several arcs about historical events and people. I also do political cartoons, but then I get these random ideas that are just funny, and I turn them into a comic. Everyone's talking about jars. I've no idea what that is. It means government expenditure and revenue Scotland. It's basically a report compiled by statisticians and economists about the fiscal year. Huh? Okay, pretend you're Scotland and I'm Westminster. <laughs> now give me all the money in your pockets. Okay, now what? Now you shut the hell up. Aha, uh -huh, now I get it. Can I have my money back? No. This one is actually a four panel one, two people just talking, and it's pretty simple. This is one where the writing is actually the most important because it's building up to the punchline at the end. And this one is about Movember, and I did this one about two and a half years ago. This next one is actually one of those kind of random ones that pops into my head, and I try to make it look a little more detailed by adding the cross hatching. And this one was about breaking the fourth wall, but then seeing it from the other side, or from behind. This one is actually one of those ones from the suffragist historical arc. And this one I had to do all by hand. And I've tried drawing digitally before, but unfortunately it's not my forte. So, this one I've actually had to crop the pictures by hand. I had to draw the characters, cut them out cut the bubbles out, and then paste everything onto the page. This one is actually, it's definitely one where the art is more important than the writing, because there is no writing. And I think the art just kind of speaks for itself here. Now, this next one is a serial comic, and it's the Westminster versus SNP. And I did it in a comic book format, so I could make the story and the art coincide with each other. And I think by drawing it in the comic format, it's more funny, and I can be more creative with the layout. In early August of 2014, I was actually researching for a PSA about Scotland. Oh, did I mention I like haggis and Smokies from our growth? Well, anyway, I was researching for this PSA, and I learned about Indie Ref, and I became interested in Scotland's political climate and what was happening there at the time. I think now is a very exciting time in Scotland, both politically and socially, and it's very interesting to learn about the politics, the UK politics, and how it affects Scotland. And I think that as long as I can continue to use the material, like the, the buffoons and the ridiculous, just the ridiculous situations that happen in Westminster, then I can continue making these comics. So that's basically me and my comic in a nutshell. If you want to check out the website, go to www.thehistorytwins.wordpress.com. I also have a Twitter, at The History Twins. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, they should all be directed to my agent and PR person, Giovanna. What way you want. Later. of my life when I was at the NME, when I was involved in what was then uh, the Labour Party-led um, pressure group Red Wedge, 
which was an attempt to get people to vote against um, the Conservatives, uh, particularly in England, but also here in Scotland. When I returned home to Scotland um, for a brief period of time to run my own independent production company, I became closer and more closely linked with the uh, independence movement uh, and particularly with um, an organisation in the first instance called Scotland United and that was a, a, again a music led um, initiative to try to uh, provoke within the minds of the kind of music going audience uh, the need for there to be greater understanding of uh, Scottish uh, political autonomy. Um, so that, that was a, quite an important period in the evolution of my own personal development politically. It's quite interesting actually going back to the housing scheme that I grew up in Lethem and just to give you a kind of feel for that place it's, it's a big you know social housing scheme uh, probably about kind of 12,000 people that live on the scheme it's now um, considerably more deprived than it was when I grew up there now when I first moved on to the scheme when it was being built uh, my father was a trade unionist he was a Labour Party activist he was a Labour Party agent for, for our local councillor um, and that was uh, a time when the state was entirely Labour dominated. There was no other alternative to it. Uh, the SNP, if they existed at all in the scheme, were a kind of fringe party, had no heartlands and whatever. But as I look now at the people that grew up around me, uh, I was a very near neighbour to uh, the Fairley family, and Andrew Fairley, of course, um, is now the uh, very successful chef at Glen Eagles. Brian Souter and his family were very near neighbours, uh, and of course he built his success through the, the stagecoach um, empire, both of them uh, coming from uh, families that were uh, part of the independence group and, and, and supporters of the SNP. Um, further down the road was Kevin Pringle, who became uh, Alex Salmon's uh, a spin doctor and is now a, a, a media manager for a promotions PR company um, and if I looked elsewhere in the, the scheme as well um, I could tell you endless families that had gone on this journey if you like from conventional labour to uh, pro-independence so it was like something maybe over a 20 or 30 year period rather than the ignition of a spark so although uh, Indie Ref 1 was an important uh, galvanizer if you like of people's attitudes towards voting for independence I had noticed the kind of shift of that probably 20 years before in the area I grew up. My name is Preston Reed, and I'm a guitarist and composer, and I, I play guitar in a style that uh, I invented uh, a couple of decades ago. It's a lot of different genres, the blues, rock, funk, country, classical. I like to take music and I guess make multiple different voices using this uh, percussive approach that, that I invented. If traditional guitar playing involves like let's say you know making a chord with this hand and, and you know picking the strings with, with the right hand, um, what I did to sort of change things was to put my hand over the top of the neck like this and start playing so that um, this hand was was uh, playing the lower strings and and this hand was doing something else so you know So it's, a, it's kind of a, a different way of, of, of seeing the, the guitar and it also involves making a percussive groove that goes along with the guitar playing. So the way that, um, that I sort of conceived of this was basically to, to, to hear these sounds in my head first 
and then try to find a way to use the guitar to move this rhythm forward. As I would learn a new thing with, with each new tune, um, I would then uh, take that that knowledge, and then that would become the you know part of what the next tune would be. So it was really uh, a style that just happened from from uh, from just basically being creative, and then and then working off of what I just learned, um, and adding that into the next tune. There were four guitar players that, that were doing interesting um, sort of playing on the neck, you know, what's called so-called tapping, you know, where you you, you, you do this or um, Michael Hedges and Eddie Van Halen and Jeff Healy and Stanley Jordan. So they were all playing um, on the on the, the the neck of the guitar, and I thought it was interesting, but it really wasn't um, something that I was really going to try to do myself because they were already playing that way. However, I found a use for that technique when it came to um, playing in this groove-oriented style that I invented. Um, it became necessary to, to, to use the, the, the tapping, or what I call hammer-ons and pull-offs, in order to, um, to, to achieve those sounds, but also to be playing drums at the same time. So. On my most recent album, uh, I'm kind of returning to this uh, all-acoustic sound that, uh, that I'm best known for. So this latest album, which is called In Here, Out There, uh, is, is all acoustic guitars. It's a baritone six-string like this, a normal jumbo six-string like, like that one over there, um, or a 12-string like that one there. So those are the guitars that are featured on, on the latest album. And like all of my albums, it, it includes a variety of music, you know, rock, but also blues and funk and, and classical, um, and a, a lot of the different influences that have always been, been part of my music. Perspective is a new series that takes a different look at a changing Scotland. We've been following Scotland's fascinating journey for a while. Our films have covered the political debate in all kinds of ways, from profiles and activism to feature documentary. The next year will be a crucial time for Scotland and, with your help, we want to take things to the next level. We're developing an eight-part series for all of Scotland. Each episode is an inspiring mix of arts and politics and focuses on key issues affecting Scotland. The series will be a valuable resource in deciding where's next for our nation.